All right, so welcome to today's presentation um, as part of our Seed Saver series on saving your cool season veggies and herb seeds. Um, we're happy to have you join us today. The housekeeping, um, this presentation is being recorded. Uh, not only feel free to ask questions as we go along in the chat, but I hope that you guys will ask questions and we're actually gonna do part of the presentation together really want to make this interactive. So we're going to do part of this together. Feel free to put questions in the chat and also unmute yourselves. I do have my camera off. Let's see. Oh, there I am. Oh, my hair looks terrible. There I am. Hello. Um, I'm a real person here, but I have it off um, just to say bandwidth and I have uh, keep everybody muted unless you're asking a question. And then if you'd like a PDF of this presentation, I am going to update the photos, um, so it won't go up today, but I will put a PDF of this presentation under recent presentations, and we'll also put the recording up on our YouTube channel. I can also drop some links in the chat, and if you want to save your chat, the three dots on the upper right-hand corner of the chat section here will let you do that. And if you're looking for recent presentations, this is what the right-hand, oh, sorry, left-hand side of our website looks like and recent presentations can be found there. So we're the San Bernardino County Master Gardeners and we're part of the Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources. And Master Gardeners are a trained group of volunteers who share peer-reviewed evidence-based research done by the University of California and other universities. And in our county, we have a little bit over 200 volunteers who have all gone through training and we focus on um, mostly growing food sustainable landscaping and better living through gardening. We have a couple of other programs in our county as part of our University of California Cooperative Extension. A lot of people have heard Extension Office or Cooperative Extension and so the Master Gardeners are part of that. And we have a nutrition program, FNEP. We also have a Master Food Preserver program and we have 4-H as well as some um, academic advisors who work with the community. We have a seed library that we started several years ago and we used to have two locations, one in Montclair and one in Ukaipa. Um, because those locations are still closed, for now we're gonna go to a pop-up method of a seed library. And right now the first location we have is Highland Library. And on the second Saturday of each month, um, we will be, I'm actually gonna put this in the PowerPoint just so, um, people remember. So we'll be at the Highland Library the second Saturday of each month and from 11 to 1 p.m. And so the second Saturday of each month from 11 to 1 p.m. you can stop by the Highland Library and in the community room we'll be in front in the front in the community room and we'll have seeds that have been donated by a larger box store. Um, to share as well as some community donated seeds. So that's our location right now. And we're hoping to do one at the Ovit Library in Ontario and a few other locations. And then also as part of our seed library, we're doing a free monthly seed saving classes. And so today is one of those classes. Um, if you guys are familiar with my presentations, I do a short um, presentation very quickly on emerging pests in the area. And even for those of you guys who have heard this before, uh, still after many years of doing this and lots of um, people trying to share this information, there's still some information that people are not quite clear on or um, some people don't know. So I want to just keep uh, sharing this messaging to make sure that we can protect our trees and our plants. Or so... Let me make sure there's nobody else in the waiting room. Nope. Okay. So really quickly, and we'll get back to our seed saving presentation. I wanna talk about citrus greening disease. Um, and it's also known as HLB or Huang Long Bing disease. And this disease is a bacteria and it is, or the disease is caused by a bacteria. It's fatal to citrus and citrus relatives. And it's not harmful to people, but uh, Florida has almost no backyard citrus. So. In fact, uh, the economist 
Uh, I guess it's a newspaper publication. Yeah, I guess it is a newspaper publication still. Um, so many things are transitioning to being online, but The Economist is doing a story on worldwide agriculture and they're spotlighting citrus greening as being um, kind of an example of a perfect storm of a way that uh, an entire agricultural commodity being citrus can be um, taken down um, by a disease or a disease complex. So uh, really serious and has affected citrus worldwide in many places. The disease has been found in Southern California, all over Southern California. Oh, and this is not the most updated map, I apologize. Uh, this, these two areas have connected. So the uh, quarantine in Riverside and the quarantine in San Bernardino County have um, come together here in the center. And so within these blue lines, then um, if you live within these blue lines, here's San Bernardino County and Orange and Los Angeles and Riverside, then uh, if you have citrus, your citrus is at risk. The disease, the bacteria is spread by a small insect, the Asian citrus psyllid or ACP is commonly called. It's about a little bit less than the size of a half a grain of rice and it feeds at a 45 degree angle. And when it feeds on plants, um, it's a piercing sucking insect and it carries this deadly bacteria in its gut. And as it feeds from one plant to the next, it spreads the disease. It will feed near where it lays its eggs, which is what you see. These are not the eggs, but the larvae. And it feeds and can infect the plant tissue where it lays its eggs. So when these larvae first, first hatch, then their first feeding could potentially be on an infected plant. And what you'll see when the disease starts to spread through the tree is um, eventually the fruit becomes bitter and misshapen. It's very inedible. The seeds are aborted or tiny and brown. And the leaves, the earlier symptoms are the leaves have asymmetrical yellowing. Eventually the leaves and the fruit fall off and within 10 years, the tree will die. I do wanna note the citrus leaf miner, which is really common and we'll start to see in the spring, um, looks terrible, but it's mostly just cosmetic. And that's there on the upper left-hand corner. Um, and you can see the damage from the citrus leaf miner here. Looks terrible, mostly cosmetic. And here is again, the symptoms of the citrus greening disease. And it is uh, mostly asymmetrical yellowing. So this time of year, a lot of people are seeing nutrient deficiencies. You might be seeing leaf miners. Um, you might be seeing your trees uh, getting dry because of the dry conditions, and none of those are going to be the same symptoms as HLB or Huang Long Bing, uh, that's the name of the disease. So if you have questions, you can send them our Master Gardener helpline uh, photos of your trees, and there's also a website I'll share in just a moment. Um, but we want to together help prevent the spread of this, di this disease in three easy steps. So one is don't share stems and leaves when you're sharing fruit. When you share fruit with stems and leaves, you run the risk of sharing this insect, its eggs or its larvae. So if you remember that this insect is a little bit smaller than a half a grain of rice, look how small the eggs are in comparison. So when you have stems and leaves on your fruit, you run the risk of sharing these pests. So we wanna remove all stems and leaves before sharing fruit. You don't wanna share any cuttings. While the disease is deadly to citrus and the tree will die within about 10 years, it takes nine months to a couple years for the symptoms to show up on the tree. So if you're sharing cuttings, you could be sharing um, trees, either receiving or giving trees that have this disease in it. And um, there is a source of clean budwood at this website right here if you wanna do cuttings. And then you wanna keep ants out of your trees and plants. And this is good best practices for your garden in general. Ants are really interesting. Ants um, act as pollinators. They act as uh, decomposers. They definitely have a role on our planet and even in our garden. Um, and one of the things that they do is they farm insects that excrete a sugary solution. So aphids, scale, the Asian citrus psyllid, um, the, the piercing sucking insects, their excrement is kind of like a sugar solution because they're feeding on the plant tissue. And the plant tissue is, uh, you know, a, a I guess it's not glucose, it's uh, carbohydrate based. Um, and so the ants are feeding off of their excrement. And, and in a study, they found it was really interesting. They found that ants um, will, uh, they, 
they will protect. So what they'll do is they'll protect these insects from beneficial predators because they're farming their excrement. So when you hear an ant is farming these pests, it might sound like they're eating the pest. They're actually not eating the pest. They're eating the pest ex excrement and they're protecting the pests. They've also been documented to move these pests like aphids or especially scale that aren't very mobile they'll move those insects around the plant and farm them in new areas. So say you had a rose and only one bud was infected with aphids. They've been known to move, again, mostly the, the studies that I read were scale, um, but they've been known to move it around to a different part of the plant to expand their farm. So the ants um, also, Another interesting thing that they've discovered is that the ants uh, cause the insects to create more excrement. The ants sort of act like bodyguards, but in exchange, they want their sugar solution. And they've actually been videoed and documented massaging the bellies of aphids in order to get them to produce more ex excrement. And studies have shown that the aphids are under duress and will produce more excrement because they're in fear of their lives from the ants. So really interesting relationship, but in short, what we care about in the garden is two things. Is one, I'll use ants, especially with a larger plant as an indication that I may have some sort of pest. In my um, tree the other day, my daughter was saying, oh, there's a lot of ants in the tree. And then we looked around and we found some scale. So I use the ants as kind of signal um, insects for another pest. And so I know you're joining today for a talk about seeds. But in order to get seeds, we need to have healthy plants. And this would be true in your cabbage, in your roses, in your trees. If you see ants in your plants, it's often an indication you have another pest. And so we wanna keep ants out of our plants so that the beneficial insects can come in and do their job. So with the Asian citrus psyllid, the one spreading this deadly citrus disease, then the ants keep this Tamarixia wasp, which is a, a beneficial predator out. They'll also keep surfid fly larvae out. They'll even throw ladybugs and ladybug larvae out. They'll throw out praying mantis larvae because they wanna protect. Again, the ants are wanting to protect these insects that they're farming. So step three in keeping your plants healthy and also helping to prevent the dis uh, citrus greening disease is we wanna keep ants out of our plants. While we don't wanna eradicate ants altogether, there's lots of things for them to do besides being in our high value plants. So we wanna keep ants out of our plants and our UC integrated pest management site, um, UC IPM site, it has some great information about ant management. And basically in, uh, it talks about sort of their life cycle and gives recommendations on best practices to keep ants away. And if you guys have questions about any of these pests, then uh, feel free to ask me at the end of the presentation. And if you wanna learn more about the citrus greening disease, which again has been found in Southern California, the insect that spreads it is everywhere and Florida has no backyard citrus. So really important, we do our part to help prevent the spread of this disease. And if you want to learn more about the disease, um, go to this website and we'll share that in the chat. If you have figs, be on the lookout. If you have early fig drop where the figs are not maturing, there's a new pest in Southern California that they want us to look out for, which is the black fig fly. And if you live near um, Upland, then um, within this quarantine, um, then they have found med flies. So they're asking that um, you don't remove fruit from your property and also that you just in general sort of be an ambassador for the don't pack a pest. They just had a, a medfly outbreak in DeVore and they did the genetics of the medfly outbreak in DeVore. That was last year or two years ago and it was traced back to Hawaii. So people had either brought fruit back from Hawaii or had fruit shipped. And so we don't want to ship fruit out of our area and we don't want to bring fruit in unless it's been gone through the proper channels. So with all of these things, um, you know, feel free to ask us questions at the end of this presentation, reach out to our Master Gardener helpline, check out the websites that I shared. And uh, if you can just tell three people and tell them to tell three people so we can spread the word, not the pest or pests in this case. That's my little public service announcement.
And if you guys have any questions about those pests, I'm happy to take those at the end of the presentation. Um, so seed saving your cool season veggies. So I'm just gonna really quickly talk about seed saving basics, seed saving from your cool season veggies, seed saving from your herbs, some tips for success, resources, and um, take questions and answers that have, or take questions that haven't um, been answered already. And uh, hold on just one second. Sorry, I have a young man here who's talking to his friends. He's getting excited. Um, so we have a couple on the, remember at the beginning of the presentation, I said that we have our um, recent presentations. And there's a couple presentations that I'm gonna reference that if you want to learn more about, you should check those out. Um, and so today we're just sort of going over um, some basics for your cool season veggie gardens to be successful. And so the three basics I'm gonna cover initially are basically you wanna know what you want to grow with these seeds. Seems like common sense, right? But when you plant those seeds, um, and you're a home seed saver, then um, having that first goal in mind of knowing what you want to grow is important. And I'll go into that in just a moment. You want to know what you're growing, who the parents are. Um, and then the third one is going to be about controlling and assisting in pollination. So uh, you want to know what you're going to grow with your seeds. So, you know, it's more than just, okay, I, well, sometimes it's not, um, you know, you planted carrots and you want to grow those carrots and you want to save seeds from those carrots and you want to grow more carrots from those carrot seeds, right? I mean, that's kind of the basics of what we want to do. But it's important to define what your expectations are. Um, if you're a seed saver that has a little bit more experience, you may be trying to create something new. Um, Maybe you are crossing two plants that have uh, have characteristics. Maybe you have a really sweet, uh, a really sweet carrot, and you have one that has really nice color. And you're trying to see if you can get that sweetness and that color. Maybe you have a tomato that has really great flavor. And maybe you also have a tomato that um, did really well in summer's heat or something like that. So you may be trying to create an intentional cross, or you may be just saving what you have and kind of seeing what you get. And a lot of the seed saving that I did when I first started was sort of finding seeds on the plant and then uh, just saving them and seeing what I got. With that saving and seeing what you get, um, it's important to understand that you might not have followed the steps needed to get the plant that you want. So a good example that we might, if you're familiar with fruit trees, that you might be familiar with is um, peaches. Peaches, you know, when they fall from the tree, they'll drop a seed. And that seed is really viable, is often very viable and it will grow a peach tree. Um, but a lot of times that peach tree, you know, it, it might flower and it might um, be a pretty tree, but often it's not going to create a peach that you wanted. So that's sort of a case of, well, the peach made a seed, so I'm going to plant it and I'm going to see what it does. And then it really doesn't provide you with much fruit. Sometimes if you're saving peas, for example, and you have a lot of different peas that you're growing, then that seed may, um, it may grow a pea plant, but it might be a pea plant where the peas don't have very good flavor. So a lot of home seed savers get frustrated and are, um, you know, kind of kind of get stuck on this area where they've saved those seeds, but when they grow them, they're just not producing what they're expecting. And um, I feel like I saw, I saw something on the internet that said, I've come to the conclusion that buying plants and planting plants is two different activities. 
And I've definitely come to the conclusion that saving seeds and successfully growing out those seeds are really two different activities and two different skill sets. So when I started, um, it was a lot of things like the background work to get the seeds that I wanted. And so I just kind of was more of the accidental seed saver where I would find peas on the vine. I would have tomatoes that um, left got left on the vine. And from there, I would save those. And I had uh, probably more failures than successes. I would have tomatoes um, that just seemed to make plants, but they just, they didn't really match the parent. And so, you know, with the time frame and the kind of garden that I was doing, I was okay with having those, you know, the seed saving was more of a, of a secondary activity. I'm sorry, my cat is trying to take down. There's something in my roof. Like I'm trying to wrestle my cat. I apologize. If I'm getting winded, I'm running around the house. Um, so, you know, I was okay with that sort of accidental seed saving, but as I've done, as I've done more seed saving, I want to take it more seriously. And really that comes to the next slide I'll show. Um, but if you're trying to get something that looks like the parent plant, you know, it has a, a good characteristics, like, you know, that parent plant has good flavor, good hardiness, or good color, um, then you really need to think about its parents. And like, I was willing to do a lot of trial and error. So if I grew things and I didn't have a lot of success, you know, I was kind of okay with that. But you may not want that. And the two reasons that I could think of that you might not want that is one, if you have limited space, so you can only grow so much of something and you wanna make sure it's gonna be successful. And the other thing is if you're sharing seeds with others. So I think if you're planning to contribute seeds to like a seed library, like ours, a community garden seed library, sharing with friends and neighbors, then you wanna be able to say, I planted this radish and this radish seed is going to give you a good radish. And that's where a lot of seed savers fall off um, because they're just like myself included. There's a lot of seeds that I'm just not confident in sharing yet. And um, I have a lot of space so I can just kind of throw things here and there and see what happens. Um, but if you have limited space, then having a seed grow that gives you what you expect is really important. And, you know, it might seem obvious, but this is the number one reason that people um, get frustrated or give up on seed saving is because, yeah, they got that seed, but the seed didn't give them what they want. And then the thing, too, is if you're a new gardener, or someone who's not like a, a, a comfortable vegetable gardener. And then also your seeds, you're not sure if your seeds are gonna give you what you want. That's a lot of variables in there. You know, Did it not give me what I want because I didn't water it properly? Um, sometimes people will save plants in the broccoli family and it won't produce a broccoli head and so then it's like, did I not water it enough? Did I not feed it enough? And if you're saving your own seed, it might not be that, it might be that the genetics are not there in place. So um, this is the area where I feel like, like I said, like most people get frustrated or give up. And I just want you guys to know that you're not alone if you've had these frustrations. And the way to really have a good handle on getting this, getting your plants to give you what you expect is in this second slide and a little bit the third slide. And these are slides, the, the, this, this slide and the next slide, which is about pollination. Oh, what happened to my pollination slide? Uh, this slide, uh, the pollination and knowing the parents are, um, presentations that we'll do an entire hour on. So for pollination traffic control, we have a presentation already up on our website if you want to understand more about that. And um, for the other one, I don't think we have a presentation up yet, but we are going to um, do one this spring. Okay, 
So really important to know the parents if you want that guaranteed success. Now I've been seed saving not that long, maybe five or six years. And um, a lot of it's just been sort of haphazard. Oh, here's seeds. Oh, let me give this a try. And it's only been in the last year that I feel like I understand the vocabulary. I understand all of the things that go into it in order to really put a focused effort. Now, it doesn't mean that it's as hard to do, but I work a couple of jobs and I have um, preteen kids. And so seed saving is something that is sort of like, you know, it's just sort of something that I do in my spare time. And, and if you were really gonna put a focused effort into it, it's definitely something you could get a handle on in one season. So if you want those reliable results, or if you're doing that accidental seed saving and you wanna know what might have gone wrong, then it's important to know the parents. And so like, like again, going back to my accidental seed saving, like if I have peas that I planted and they went to, you know, they made pods and I didn't harvest them or I missed them and I saved the seeds, um, then often I'm at a loss for the parents because I'm not a great documenter and I always encourage people to document. Um, so if you're saving those peas at the end of the season, do you know what kind of peas they are? Do you know if they were hybrid? Do you know if they were open pollinated? For a long, for several years, that information was um, not readily available to me. And so a garden journal would certainly help you um, track that because as much as you think you're going to remember, at least I don't remember. So the parents, if the parents are a hybrid, and a hybrid is different than a GMO, a GMO is a genetically modified organism, a hybrid is a cross between two different parents. And a lot of us were introduced into this or to this in, uh, you know, like high school genetics where they talked about Mendel and his pea plants and he had white pea plants and purple pea plants. And when he crossed them, then they were all purple, but the next generation had some purple and some white. Um, another example would be like a blue eyes and brown eyes. If you have a mother with brown eyes and a father with blue eyes, then the child might have blue eyes or might have brown eyes. And so those are examples of hybrid characteristics. A common hybrid that we grow is an early girl tomato. And that one is bred for both flavor and having a little bit of um, not a thin skin, but not a thick skin. Um, so they're bred for a couple of different characteristics. I think it's a, a, a aroma type cross with something that's much more juicy and flavorful. And so if you are seed saving from hybrids, so like with these peas, if you imagine this F1 or first generation, first filial generation, then these would be your early girl tomatoes here on this second generation. Because what they do is, um, so this would be your early girl tomatoes that you would buy. So if you bought them in seeds or you bought them in plants, this is where you're coming in, you're buying them. And their parents are a cross of a tomato that has a thick skin, and a tomato with a good flavor. So this is a hybrid. This is a cross between two different parents. In the photo here, it's a cross between a white and a purple pea. So that means that when you plant those seeds, they're all going to represent the dominant genetics um, of that cross. And they've been doing this for many years, so they're very reliable. So all of the fruit that you get, whether this was a pea or a tomato or a flower, then that generation, when you buy that hybrid, all of the fruit or flowers will, will give you the desired look. But when you seed save from that generation, you're not gonna get all purple flowers or all early girl tomatoes. You're gonna get a combination as the genetics break back out. And so we do have a whole class on the genetics, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on it. But basically, if you're planting a seed from a hybrid, then you're not sure that that fruit you grow will look like what you expect it to. But when you save the seeds, the genetics will start to break, break back out. And some of them will be like one of the parents and some will be like the other. Genetically modified organism. A lot of times I see seeds advertised as being non-GMOs. 
And while I'm definitely um, very progressive when it comes to environmental issues, it is important to understand that most of the seeds, in fact, all of the seeds available to home gardeners um, we can't buy genetically modified seeds. We can't buy GMO seeds. They're not available to us. I think there's only eight or 11 crops that they make GMOs. And so whether you are in favor of GMOs or not, I do want you as a consumer to be aware that it's often a tactic used to increase the price of products and GMO seeds are not available to the home gardener. So, um, None of them, even if they say they're, if, if, if one package is advertised as GMO, non-GMO, and the other packet doesn't say, they're all non-GMO. So I just want to make that clear for your home vegetable gardening. Um, GMOs are something that we can't buy, and it is an advertising ploy. Um, so I just always want you, they may not be bad companies. I'm not making any judgment of the companies that are using those. Um, words on there, but I just want you to be mindful of that. But you can definitely be buying hybrids. And hybrids are also created for disease resistant. A lot of times you'll buy tomatoes and they'll say VFN resistance, and that's verticillium wilt, fusarium wilt, and nematode resistance. Um, a lot of plants are bred for resistance, and so they may be hybrids. And so if you are seed saving from hybrids, um, you don't know what you're going to get in that next generation. So when we seed save, um, and to know your parents, to know the parents of the plants you want to seed save from, then you want to get open pollinated plants. Another word you'll see a lot in seed saving is heirloom. And heirloom is kind of a loose a loosely or casually used word without a really specific definition. Some people just define an heirloom seed as a plant that's been grown for more than 30 years. Some people define an heirloom seed as a plant from pre-World War II. And usually when we see the word heirloom, we think back to, you know, old or something that is antique or something that's been around for a long time. And that's the loose definition of heirloom, that this is a plant that has been grown for a long time and it's open pollinated. And open pollinated means it's not intentionally crossed. So instead of having a purple and a white flower, you would have two purple flowers and they're allowed to naturally cross. But where a lot of people get confused and have trouble is just because something is open pollinated, it doesn't mean it can't cross or hybridize naturally in the wild. So if you have five different kind of peas and they're all open pollinated, they may still cross with other peas in the garden. So we have a whole talk about pollination traffic control. And that's what that talk is about. And that one is up on our website. And um, it really is a topic that too much to cover today. But I want you guys to really understand that if you're trying to get that seed where you can say, Yes, Mary, I grew these radishes. And when you plant these radishes, they will look like this radish right here in my hand. If you want to have that degree of confidence, um, one, it takes practice and time. But two, you really need to know the parents that you grow from and you want to be growing from open pollinated seeds. You absolutely can save seeds from hybrids and some people do it just for fun. If you grow alyssum, alyssum is a white flower that um, surfid flies really like. That's that beneficial predator that I talked about earlier. And alyssum often is sold um, as a purple flower, but it reverts back to white because white is the dominant gene. And I have it growing all over my grove. And it's kind of fun because occasionally little purple patches will pop up. And that's where um, two sets of purple recessive genes have found each other. And um, so seed saving from hybrids is not, it's not that you can't do it. You just don't know necessarily what you're gonna get. And so if you're an experienced gardener and wanting to play around, then seed saving from hybrids can be extra fun and uh, adds a little adventure and spice to life. You wanna understand a little bit about the parents, know if they crossbreed easily. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. You wanna know if they're self-pollinating. Do they need a pollinizer or a pollinator? And we'll talk about that in just a second. And you need to know how many plants you need for viable seeds. And we'll talk more about that in just a second. And please feel free to ask questions.
as we go along, um, either unmute or put questions in the chat, okay? Um, so when you're understanding the parents, a good place to start is to know what family the parents are in. And I'm gonna show you my go-to chart. It's not a university chart. And it's really interesting. You know, the university has spent a lot of time researching growing crops from seed, but they don't compile it all. You know, if you're an alfalfa grower or you're a corn grower or you're a, you know, asparagus grower, then they, they kind of divide those up separately. So it is a little bit hard for home gardeners to find a chart of all the seeds together. But Seed Savers Exchange has a wonderful chart that we'll be using for our activity today. And so you can see here, you've got what, two, four, six, eight, 10-ish, 10 plant families here. And it's important to know that all of these plants within these families can cross breed. So eggplants, peppers, potatoes, tomatoes, they can crossbreed, although they're less likely to because they're self-pollinating. A lot of the plants in the mint family can crossbreed, the legume family, the brassica family is big on crossbreeding. So all of these plants listed here on the right, um, when you're growing them, you may be creating hybrids in your yard without being aware of it. And that can lead to some seed saving frustration. Going back to pollination and thinking about the families. So if you have, you know, for example, you're growing um, broccoli and cabbage and cauliflower and kale, those are all in the same family, meaning they can crossbreed. And to the first question for, uh, this is called the brassica or mustard or cabbage family. Going back to the brassica family, and do they crossbreed easily? Yes, they crossbreed very easily, making it hard to seed save from them. Are they self-pollinating? The solanaceae family, which is your eggplants, peppers, tomatoes, potatoes, they are self-pollinating. Um, they're not all equally self-pollinating, um, but they are self-pollinating, meaning they're less likely to crossbreed. You want to know, do they need a pollinizer, which is like with an avocado, you have a pollinizer, an A family, and a, a type A and a type B. And that has to do with the um, fruit development. So if they need a pollinizer, then it's usually tied to needing a second plant for that fruit to develop. So with peaches or cherries, cherries often need a pollinizer. So a cherry needs another cherry in the, another plant in the cherry, another cherry tree to make fruit. And then some of them need pollinators like your squashes. A lot of times people don't uh, get a good squash crop because they don't have pollinators um, for the squash and they may need to do hand pollinating. And in that vein, do you have the pollinizer which is a, a pollinizer, I apologize. So a pollinizer is another plant needed for successful fruit production. So like an A type and a B type avocado or a different, you know, two different types of cherries or something like that. And then a pollinator is an insect or it could be an ant or it could be a human um, spreading pollen around. And so this is the other topic that I have an entire hour on. So let's look at some common cool season veggies and apply this. We'll talk about broccoli, carrots, radishes, lettuce, and peas. And if we have time and there's engagement, then we can talk about a few other things too. Oh. So the Seed Stavers Exchange is like my go-to for information for homeowners. Um, again, it's not because the University of California doesn't have good information, it's because that information is targeted toward commercial growers who are um, dealing with other things. And a lot of commercial growers don't grow their own seed. And so they don't have to worry about that cross-pollination. But the Seed Savers Exchange has, this is my chart. This is like, no, not my chart. This is their chart, but this is my go-to chart for um, information about seed saving. It is so helpful. Um, and this is the chart we're going to do our activity on. So you see the chart is broken down into crop. So we're going to be looking at broccoli and it talks about the species. You can see the species for broccoli is brassica and the family that it's in. 
uh, the family is the one that um, you're probably looking to see. Okay, so you see here on this chart, for example, broccoli rob, broccoli, and uh, arugula are all in the brassica family, meaning they might cross pollinate. You see, you have um, a couple of plants in the amaranth family. You have the beets and amaranth. You have um, the pea family or Fabaceae and the adzuki bean and the bean are both in those family. And so those are gonna cross pollinate. So that's the family. And this is a really important column for you to make note of when you're trying to seed save successfully, this family column. The life cycle is important to note. Your annual plants are going to give you um, a plant flower within that first season. So for example, you have um, your uh, arugula. The arugula is an annual. And that means if you plant the arugula this season, it will flower this season. See things like asparagus as are perennial and asparagus um, will go to seed each season. And then you see things like broccoli, oops, or beets are a biennial. And that means it will give you a seed in the second season. There's a couple of exceptions to that. So a second season would be like if you grew a carrot or a broccoli this winter, it will give you seeds next winter, next spring. Um, so it's not two years, but it's two growing seasons. So if it was a summertime vegetable, then, um, and interestingly, a lot of the ones that are biennial are not summertime vegetables, they're cool season veggies, but it means that you'll get it that next year. So if you are wanting carrot seeds, the carrot probably won't go to flower until next spring. The first year it grows the root and then it will sort of go dormant. And on the second season, it will make that flower head. There are some exceptions to that. Another common biennial plant is um, an onion. So carrots and onions are biennial plants. And if the plant is stressed, sometimes they do go to seed the first season. So if you have a carrot that you're growing out and for whatever reason, the carrot finds itself really stressed, it's trying to save its lineage and it might go to flower that first season, but expect that if you are growing, um, and that's why I like to check with the carrots, I was waiting for flowers and waiting for flowers and oh, it doesn't flower till next season. So I had to wait till next year to get the carrot flowers. So that's the life cycle part. And this will help you plan how much time you need like for that space. So if you plant this little corner of your raised bed with carrots and you're hoping to get carrot seeds, then when you look at this chart and you say, oh, carrots are biennial, I'm gonna need to leave those carrots in all the way through till next year. Um, and I actually, for my seed plants, I grow them in pots on the side, so they're out of the way. Here they talk about the primary pollination method. You can see the adzuki bean and the common bean are both self-pollinated. Um, you can see the, the cucumber is insect pollinated, which means it's gonna need a pollinator. And um, broccoli is also insect pollinated. So these things are gonna need a pollinator in your yard. Some of them, when you see something being wind pollinated, that is an indication. So basically the wind is enough to pollinate that. It's not self-pollinated and it gets pollinated by the wind. When you see that, oops. Just turned off my computer, sorry. Um, when you see that it's wind pollinated, you'll also notice some differences in this uh, right hand, uh, in the column to the right. So going ahead to this um, next column, the recommended isolation distance, that goes back to how easily that plant will crossbreed. How easily will that plant get DNA or genetics from a plant that's nearby. And so you'll see the adzuki bean is self-pollinating. And in addition to being self-pollinating, it is also um, can, uh, so it's self-pollinating. Whoops, that was supposed to be an arrow. And you can see that it only needs to be isolated about 10 feet from other plants in um, the area. So say you're growing 10 different kinds of beans and you wanted an adzuki bean that, or, or also just a regular common bean that was gonna give you seeds that would not be 
crossed with other so say you were growing an adzuki bean and a regular bean or a common bean together then they would need to be about 10 feet apart or they would start crossing genetically okay so the this probably this recommended isolation distance and how it is affecting or affected by the primary pollination method. These were these were two of the things that probably took me the longest to, like I could understand it on an intellectual level, but to really absorb it, it really was probably one of the most challenging things that I had. It took me time to absorb all the implications of this. So if you look at, for example, broccoli, you will see that uh, broccoli down here, it needs to be 800 feet to a half a mile from any other brassicas. So if any of your neighbors are growing cabbage or they're growing kale or they're growing anything in the brassica family, which going back to this chart here is a lot of different plants. If anybody, including yourself, is growing these and you're within 800 feet, they're probably going to cross pollinate. So we'll kind of talk about the implications of that in just a second. And then there's also this um, last three columns. The first column is uh, viable seeds and viable just means something that will sprout. Then you get into variety maintenance and genetic preservation. And you're probably not trying to preserve the genetics. You know, it's sort of like, like I, my, my mother has blue eyes and my dad had brown eyes and I have blue eyes. And so if you looked at me, I would just look like a blue eyed person, but genetically I carry the genes for brown eyes and blue eyes. My kids have brown eyes. And so most of us gardeners are more worried about how things taste or how things look than we are about the actual genetics. And so the genetics may not match. And so if you're trying to seed save from an adzuki bean, then you don't need them to be genetically identical, probably at the home gardening level. And even at the variety maintenance level, um, and I'll show you where these terms are defined so you can revisit that, um, you're probably most likely just looking for viable seeds. You'll see with asparagus, you need two plants and one of them needs to be male, one needs to be female. For the artichoke and the broccoli and a lot of them, they generally recommend, uh, five plants. So let's talk about broccoli. So what I'm going to do, I'm sorry, I'm next to my phone. We got all kinds of action. I'm going to take you guys to my go-to website, which is the Seed Savers Exchange. I'm going to show you guys, and we're going to use this website to do a quick little activity and um, to help you sort of think about what you want to seed save in your own yard. Make sure I'm still sharing my screen, yep. So the Seed Savers Exchange, they are selling stuff. I'm not endorsing them as a master gardener, um, but they sure have some really great resources. And so, um, and yes, I'm gonna put this PowerPoint up on the website. There was a question in the chat about that. So this will be up on our Master Gardener website under recent presentations. And so if you go to the Seed Savers Exchange programs and resources, under resources, you go to the gardening and seed saving guide. And I do want to point out that um, on the PowerPoint under the resources I have to share with you, I've broken out different elements of their website so you can more clearly until you really get to know the website so you can navigate where you wanna go. So if you scroll down, they have seed starting, plant care, pollinators and soil and seed saving. And so make sure I always pick the wrong one. Just the right one. No, that's not the right one. I always pick the wrong one. Let's go back here. So under seed saving, uh, then seed saving chart, is that the right one? Let's see here. Yes, okay, so this is where that chart that I just walked you guys through, which really is like my go-to for seed saving. And, and, it, and I show in, in the PowerPoint, I have the link directly and it said seed saving chart. 
And from here, they redefine those things that I just covered. Remember the different columns that we just looked at? Here are those definitions. And here toward the end, they define what variety maintenance and genetic preservation means. So you'll have that um, in case you forget what the columns mean. From there, you can download the chart. And we're gonna start, here's the chart, five pages of great information. So we're gonna start with the broccoli. And we're gonna copy out the broccoli section. And I wanna show you guys how you would use this to seed save your broccoli. So let's go back to our slide for broccoli. Okay. So for the broccoli, I'm gonna paste, oops. Oh, I can't paste stuff in while we're in the presentation, I forgot. So I'm gonna paste this in. We'll just sort of consider this like a little worksheet or activity. So here we have our broccoli column. The difficulty for broccoli is hard. Why? Because they crossbreed easily. You'll notice the isolation distance from other in the brassica family, which is a big family, is 800 feet to a half mile. They also, um, broccoli we usually harvest when it's this immature flower head. So you need to let the plants flower, go to flower in order to um, get the seeds and you would lose the produce. So they're, how they're pollinated is by insects. Um, how many plants do you need for viable seeds? Five. And so if you wanted to seed save from broccoli, you would have to create, and we'll talk a little bit more about isolation distances right at the end of the presentation. I'm probably gonna run about 10 minutes over. Um, and I will post this recording on the website. If you need to go to 4.30, then um, you can listen to the last 10 or 15 minutes of the presentation uh, on our website. Um, but so for the broccoli, um, then you need to create an isolation distance. And I, like I said, we'll talk about that at the end of the presentation really quick. And that's also can be found in our pollination traffic control um, presentation, which can be found on our website. Insect pollination needs to occur. Um, so if you can't keep them screened off or keep them away from insects because the insects are um, the ones doing the pollinating and you're gonna need at least five broccoli plants probably for viable seeds. And so the best tip for the broccoli is to plan ahead and think about, are you planting any other plants in the brassica family? So I wanna go on to the next one. And I want to go back again to our chart and we're gonna scroll down to carrots and we're going to use this chart to see what we need to do to seed save from carrots. So for your carrots, we'll drop this in. So I've got my chart here and I have, my ch I have the chart printed up and I have it at my house and I look at it all the time. For carrots, the difficulty is medium. They do crossbreed easily, uh, somewhat easily with other plants in the Apaceae family. Um, and so you would scroll through this chart and you would say, okay, I'm looking for all the plants. So celery is one that you can see and celerac is another that you see is in the same family. And so you could scroll through cilantro is in the same family, coriander, which is um, basically is this cilantro, that's the name of the seed, also in the same family. Um, what else do you have? Dill is in the same family. So these are plants. So, so when I'm like, okay, I want a seed say from the carrots, then I look and see what other plants are in that family. And then I can sort of see, am I gonna be successful? Um, they also um, are a biennial. And so you're not gonna be able to harvest that carrot. You're gonna to have to leave that carrot in the ground. And so you lose that produce kind of, right? Um, how are they pollinated? They're pollinated by insects. How many plants do you need for viable seeds? That's gonna be five. And the biggest um, challenge or tips for success with carrots is making sure that you have a place for them in the garden that we already talked about for next year. So knowing this information, knowing from the family, what will it crossbreed with? How easily will it crossbreed? What pollination method do they have? And how many plants do I need? This is where you're gonna have your starting place for seed saving carrots. 
I'm going to go through three other plants. And if you guys have questions, um, let me know as we go. Um, and, and the reason I didn't prepare this ahead of time is I wanted you to sort of see that um, for a person who I wouldn't consider myself an experienced seed saver, but a person with a little bit of experience, how I would go through the process using this chart to know how successful my seeds were going to be. So I get the radish section, got our radishes here. The difficulty I would say is medium, and I would actually say it's probably medium to hard because it is in the brassica family. Every time I see that, I say, ah, because that means it crossbreeds really easily with a lot of other plants. And usually what you get, like if you've ever heard of broccolini, which is not little broccolis, it's a hybrid of broccoli. Um, Kaleettes is a combination between Brussels sprouts and kale. Those are all accidents in the garden that created great things. So crossbreeding can sometimes come up with some really interesting things, but often what it creates is a plant that doesn't make a fruit or doesn't flower, doesn't do what you want. So radishes can be a little bit tricky. Um, also with the radish, you're not gonna be able to harvest the radish. You lose the produce. Um, you need to leave that radish in the ground. They are an annual, so yay to that. You know, we are gonna get that seed in that first season. On the right-hand side here, you can see what their seed pods look like. They actually sort of look like little beans. And um, so then when we look at how are they pollinated, they're pollinated by insects. And in most gardens, um, insect pollination is not going to be an issue. The main thing that I point out the insect pollination is because sometimes people will screen off plants to protect them from harmful pests. And just note that if you're like for a radish, you don't need access to pollinators to get your radish. You will get a radish whether there's pollinators or not because that's the root of the plant. You don't even need to let it go to seed to get the produce. So if you are planning on seed saving from it when it's in flower, now you could protect it the rest of the time. So say you planted 30 radishes, you can see that you need five radishes for viable seeds. Then you pull out 25 radishes and you leave five radishes behind and you protect them from your pests with some sort of screen or mesh or whatever you have. But when they go to flower, you open it up to pollinators and let those pollinators do their job. That's important to get the seeds. So that's where this chart is important. Um, and tips for success for radishes. It's just going to try to be not to have them um, flowering at the same time as other brassica plants. Okay, it's I've uh, got two more examples. So we got lettuce. We're going to look at lettuce. And we're going to do so we'll go through our chart. We'll pull up our lettuce here. So we say, okay, I, and lettuce is an easy one. I like lettuce. Lettuce is uh, one of a good, a good cool season uh, starter plant. And so for uh, seed saving. So we're going to have our lettuce here. So, okay, the lettuce, we see it's in the Asteraceae family. So we would go back to our chart and we would say, what other Asteraceae family are there? Okay, we've got lettuce, Italian dandelions. If you're growing Italian dandelions, they might crossbreed with your lettuce. What else do we have? Endive and escarole, escaroles. I'm not sure I'm saying that right. Those will also crossbreed. So we would look through our chart and see what else is in the Asteraceae family. Celtus, I guess that's that's maybe a celery and lettuce cross. Celtus is um, also in the Asteraceae family. So then we're noting that and we're looking around and seeing what else is in our garden or maybe when we're planning to plant things, we're planning that out. The seed saving level is easy. Um, they don't crossbreed. Look, they do, they are in um, family with other things that we talked about, but they're self-pollinating and they only cross pollinate at 10 to 20 feet. So as long as you don't have anything else in the Asteraceae family um, within 10 to 20 feet, you're fine. If you grow 10 varieties of lettuce and they cross pollinate, you could come up with some interesting flavor and color combinations. So whereas with, because if you think about it, lettuce, you're eating the leaves and all of the, all plants are gonna grow and make a leaf. So 
if lettuce crossbreeds with other lettuce, you're still going to get a leaf. You may not like the way they crossbred, the flavor, the toughness, something like that, but it's still going to get you a leaf. With a brassica, and, you know, and you're looking at like, if you think of a, a Brussels sprout compared to a broccoli, they set their flower heads in a different way. We eat an immature flower head, cabbage, we eat the immature flower cluster before it even, you know, creates that flower cluster. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong if the plant has mixed genetics. Genetics With lettuce, they're all going to make leaves and it will just be a cross. Um, lettuce is an annual plant, so yay to that. You know that you're going to get flowers in that first season. Um, you don't lose produce um, on that one. Let's see, sorry about that. So because you, when you harvest lettuce, the idea to harvesting lettuce is that you pick the leaves off around the edge and you can continue to harvest the lettuce um, and also let it go to flower eventually. So you don't lose the produce, which is nice. Um, and the only thing that makes them challenging is that they do, it is like a dandelion. You can see in this photo up here what the lettuce flower head looks like. Um, it has a little umbel on it, and so they are ready to fly. Let's look at our chart again and see um, how they're pollinated. Is they're self-pollinated, so they don't need um, any other plants. You'll notice they only need one plant for viable seeds. So another reason why lettuce is a great one to start with. And then we're going to finish up with peas here. So we'll go back to our chart. We'll look up our peas. And... We will copy that out. And um, so for winter time, I would say lettuce and peas are a great place to start. Those are things that you can plant right now. It's not too late. Hopefully our spring isn't too warm and you can harvest those seeds this spring. And if you already have those things growing, you may have um, lettuce or pea seeds um, on the ready. So, um, we have, uh, they're easy to seed save. They are, uh, sorry, I copied these bullet points out and I forgot to take that out. So they're easy, why? Because they're self-pollinating, they're annual, which means they're gonna make a crop of seeds this year. Um, they don't cross pollinate within 10 to 20 feet of each other. And for pollination, um, they are uh, self-pollinated. So that's great. That's something we wanna see. And you only need one plant in order to get viable seeds. And the main tip for peas is to let them make sure they dry on the plant. Like the sugar snap peas or the peas you harvest when they're still immature, just note that we eat them when they're immature and they won't, they're not fully formed. So they need to dry on the plant. Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm happy to go back over this at the end of the presentation. But basically, what else, you know, are you growing arugula? Are you growing, let's, you know, really quickly just look at our chart. Are you growing parsley? Are you growing uh, shallots, rutabagas, runner beans, rice, um, quinoa, quinoa um, pumpkins? All of these things, you figure out what you're growing. And you can determine the difficulty by figuring out, you know, how are they pollinated? How many plants are needed for viable seeds and what family they're in? So I have internalized that information. And then for everything, I just go back to this chart. I don't have any of this memorized. Some of this I sort of know through time and I'm like, oh yeah, okay, I know this. But um, this chart is my go-to. And I think if you print it up and you use it as a reference, then um, it's going to be really, really helpful. So I break down every plant like this when I'm looking at how I seed save. So for herbs, cilantro is an easy one to start from seed. And, and this brings up a point. Um, just because you can save the seed doesn't mean the seed is easy to start. So strawberry seeds, they're right on the outside of the fruit. They're very easy to harvest. You can see them right there, but they need a period of uh, cold temperatures and they need to be planted very shallow 
They need to be kept evenly moist. They're very hard to start seeds from. Blueberries is another one. You can start the seeds, but it adds like three to five years before you get fruit. Um, so native plants, another example of plants that easy maybe to save the seeds, but not so easy to start them. Cilantro and basil, very easy to start from seeds. Rosemary, um, you can start from seeds, but also really easy to start from cuttings. Lavender is an herb that's very easy and most successfully started from cuttings. So just because you can doesn't always mean you should. All of these obviously have a seed, but like rosemary and lavender do best from cuttings. Uh, rosemary also can grow relatively easy from seed. Fennel, dill, bee balm, um, cat mint, um, those are ones that their seeds can be very invasive. They go to seed really easily. They're very easy to seed save from, but they can be invasive. So be careful about the planting of those. There's, I think it's fennel has caused, a, is, is an invasive weed. And I think the Channel or Santa Cruz Islands um, and have caused a lot of problems because they're so invasive. Mint is typically a really invasive garden plant, but it actually usually is invasive through its root structure and not so much for a lot of the plants in the mint family um, from their seeds, but their seeds are super tiny. So with the herbs, you're gonna go through the same thing that you went through um, with the vegetables, which is sort of determining their difficulty, how they're pollinated, how many seeds are needed to be viable, and this chart includes, like here we have up here at the top, parsley. So the parsley is biennial, which means it's gonna make its seed next year. It's insect pollinated and you need five and it's in the Apaceae family and may cross pollinate with those plants. Um, cilantro is one that's really easy. And so um, you'll see that it's an annual, which is good. Cilantro will cross pollinate, but remember how I talked about um, the look of a plant versus the genetic makeup of a plant. Like I have blue eyes, but I carry the genetics of both blue and brown eyes. Cilantro may carry the genetics, and this is true of a lot of the herbs. They may carry the genetics of other plants, but to the look and taste, they're probably gonna match what we want. So most of the herbs, while they are not necessarily um, genetically matching and they may be doing some crossbreeding because if you look back at the PowerPoint um, and we look at the families, then um, you can see like uh, a lot of these in the mint family, um, you have uh, marjoram, mint, oregano, rosemary, sage, and thyme and basil. Um, these then, you know, are all in Lam the Lamace Lamaceae family. I'm not sure, I don't think I'm saying that right, but they're all in the same family. And so they may crossbreed on a genetic level, but for the most part, when you grow marjoram next to rosemary, you're not going to come up with a marjoram rosemary hybrid. It's going to look like what you expect. So herbs are a great plant to practice seed saving from. Um, let's see. So Finishing up here, I'm probably like four more minutes. Uh, thank you guys for staying over. Um, I want to touch on if your cool season veggies, which would be like right now, could be any of your broccoli, your cabbage, your cauliflower. Did they bolt in the heat? Um, let them go to flower. Look at this is a flower from a cabbage plant and uh, it was a beautiful flower. The pollinators loved it. And this would have been an opportunity for me for me to seed save. Now I didn't know the genetic makeup of the parent, um, and this was actually an ornamental cabbage. And so when I seed save from it and I plant those seeds, I don't know what I'm going to get, but it's still a fun exercise. It added value to my garden as a pollinator habitat, and it was really pretty. So if your cool season veggies bolt or they go to flower when they're not supposed to, um, don't despair um, because it's a good seed saving practice opportunity. So my tips for success are um, make sure your seeds are dry before they're stored. And you also wanna make sure they're fully mature on the plant before you harvest them. So when we're looking back at like, for example, 
the peas in the center here, this is not fully mature. If you harvest it, it's not going to probably produce a viable seed. They need to be dry on the plant. For your lettuce, these seeds, right when they're making this little parasol, um, like dandelion thing up here at the top, those seeds are still immature and they're probably not viable. They need to be dry like this on the plant. For your um, radishes and your broccoli, they're going to make a pod. This pod uh, is not fully mature. They need to be dry on the plant. Your carrots, it needs to start to dry on the plant. Um, and your broccoli as well. They'll make a little pod like the radish, but it's a little bit longer. Again, it needs to dry on the plant. That's the same thing for your herbs. Your herb seeds need to dry on the plant. The exception to that drying on the plant rule is for something that's in a fleshy fruit like a tomato or a cucumber. And that's not going to dry on the plant, but they still need to be fully mature before you harvest them. You want to store all your seeds in a cool, dry place and then regrow them next year. Or if, for example, you had lettuce going to seed right now, you could probably plant that lettuce again and get another season. You want to make sure you label them label, 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 you think you're going to remember, but if you're like me, you probably don't. And so label everything. And, and if you're going to do any seed saving, I really encourage you, even if you're not consistent, to start a garden journal and try your best to document because when you have seeds that are really successful, you'll want to know what you did. And if you have seeds that don't work, you'll also want to look back and know what you did. And so this last bullet point, um, is something that we talk about a lot during the pollination traffic control talk. And it's where you're creating distance from your plants. Remember, we had this isolation distance, right? You have an isolation distance that goes anywhere from 10 to 20 feet, all the way up to 800 feet to a half a mile. And so for the isolation distance, it basically means that if those two plants are flowering at the same time, that um, they are going to potentially crossbreed. But if they're not flowering, so if you're growing a broccoli and you're growing a cabbage, but the broccoli is going to flower and the cabbage is not in flower, they're not crossbreeding at that time. So you can isolate flowers. Maybe if you have something that you want to seed save from and it needs pollinators, but you have something else that's flowering and you don't want them to crossbreed, Maybe you're isolating that flower by covering it with gauze. Maybe you're pinching those flowers off, depending on the situation. Um, the other thing you can do is create distance. So, you know, like peppers crossbreed fairly easy with other peppers. So maybe you could plant peppers on one side of your house and then another type of peppers on the other side of the house. Or maybe you're planting a bell pepper and a hot pepper and you want to see what happens if they crossbreed. So you just let them grow right next to each other. But also keep in mind that you can create distance through time. So if you plant 10 kinds of lettuce, but you plant one this week and one two weeks from now and another one two weeks from now or then and da 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 in succession using succession planting, then the first one's going to go to flower before the second one goes to flower, before the third one goes to flower. So maybe you can grow 10 types of lettuce at the same time, but they're not going to flower at the same time. That gets a little bit trickier in the summer with plants like squash or tomatoes or peppers where they keep producing a lot of flowers um, because it's not like a one-time flower stock, it's ongoing flowering. But a lot of your cool season veggies do make a one-time flower stock. And once the seeds go into a pod, so once the seed, you know, right, at this stage, they can cross pollinate because the flowers are open, they can be pollinated. But once they go into um, a pod, then no more cross pollination can occur. So if you were to have, for example, uh, radishes and, and your radishes had gone into a pod and you had other radishes flowering or a broccoli or something else flowering, the pollination has already occurred for this radish. So planting something in November and planting something in December and planting something in January, if you don't have a lot of space in your yard is a way to create distance through time. And we talk more about that in the pollination traffic control. 
So my recommendations for what's next, um, start small. Think about seed saving when you're buying your plants or your seeds. Look for words like hybrid. Look for words like F1, which is an indication that it's the first filial generation of a hybrid. Look for words like first filial. Look for words like um, open pollinated. And so open pollinated is going to tell you that you're probably going to have more success. But again, just because it's open pollinated, it doesn't mean you don't have to do some pollination traffic control at home. So check out that presentation. Um, and, and know that the word heirloom just means that it's open pollinated, but it's also not a guarantee of success if you don't do some pollination traffic control. Okay. And then um, just be opportunistic, catch seeds as they appear, try to grow them out and try to see what happens. See, do you like the flavor? And then sort of work backwards. Was this a hybrid? Did I have 10 different kinds of peas growing? So they actually all crossbred and I came up with something really disgusting. Maybe you came up with something really great. Um, and then just remember that becoming a seed saver takes time. Um, start small, give yourself time to learn and then join our free monthly classes and um, bring your questions. You know, I really would like to um, create a dialogue with our counties and community seed savers. So definitely bring your questions. I have two pages of resources. You'll notice a lot of these are from the seed savers exchange, but I have like a general res resources, isolation methods, seed saving terms, um, and uh, isolation distance guides. So I kind of broke the website down. I'm gonna drop these really quickly into the chat. This presentation is also going to be up on our website um, in the next day or so. Um, and I did see there was a question in the chat. So I'm gonna to get to that in just a second. Let me drop these other resources. Um, and I am happy to stay on until five o'clock. I really appreciate you guys staying on a little bit longer. I'm happy to stay on till five to answer any questions. And I encourage you to um, bring your questions to any of our upcoming seed saving talks. Even if it's not a topic you're super interested in, drop in in the last five minutes and ask your questions at the end of the talk. Um, check out our website, which I know you use to sign up for this class. Um, you can sign up for our newsletter there. Um, you can also follow us on social media. And then I just wanna say thank you for coming and for any of your gardening questions, um, you can always reach out to our Master Gardener helpline and I'll drop that information in the chat as well. So um, with that, let me just get this last piece of information and if I can copy it in, into the chat here. And can I, too many graphics, they're not letting me, there we go. Okay, I'll get this into, or will I get this into the chat? And I'll address that last question. I think I'm gonna stop recording. Um, so thank you guys for those of you who are listening to this as a recording and uh, pop into any of our upcoming presentations to ask your questions. So thank you so much.